Welcome to Veterans AZ. This episode features Margie Bonds from the Military Assistance Mission, an Arizona nonprofit dedicated to helping our military service members and their families. Thanks very much, uh, Margie, for being here with us this afternoon to talk about Military Assistance Mission. Um, the Military Assistance Mission was founded after you lost your son, Michael, who was serving as a Marine in combat. Can you tell us a little bit more about Michael? <laughs> he was a cool kid. I, I always say that because he really just was a cool kid. He was very funny. Um, but when it came to um, serving our country and being a Marine, he was very serious. And I was like, wow, this is something I had not seen. So yeah, he was really very much a warrior. And how did he end up choosing the Marines? His dad was a Marine. Um, my stepdad was a Marine. I'm not sure if that had anything to do with it, but his dad was. When he was about two years old, he was wearing his dad's little blues, his blues jacket, and he was tripping over it, and he was wearing his lid, and uh, he just, that was it. And that was a big bond with him and his dad, that and boxing. So he was great, yeah. Good kid. Well, uh, can you tell us why creating this charity was was so important to you in the wake of, of your loss? Well, when Michael was active duty in North Carolina, um, occasionally he would run into a financial issue. And if you're active duty, you know, that is your job. That is your only job. Um, and then he moved out to Arizona, and he had a hard time fitting into the civilian world. And thankfully, there's not a lot of call for what his job was, you know, what his MOS was. So um, he was joined the reserves and that's a part-time you know and the pay is not what active duty is because you can have a civilian job and I remember him coming and saying mom do you have money I have to go I have to go get gas or I don't have any gas or I don't have any food or I don't have this and I've got to get to drill so I need some some gas money for that and when he was killed you know, there's a lot of ways that you can go with that. You know, um, like I laid in closets and I kicked and screamed and hollered. And I, I will tell you that a steering wheel cannot be beat up. I've tried that. Um, but I realized that the most important thing was helping. And that's what he would want. And I had to pull up my Marine Mom bootstraps and help somebody else's kid. Because I don't want them to not have gas money or have food or not be able to pay their rent while serving our country. Was it a surprise to you that our military members had these financial needs? It was because everybody's, you know, hears that if you're in the military, you make a lot of money. And that can be true at a higher rank. Our lowest rank, which is what MAM serves, that is not the case. So I was very surprised that that was a thing, you know, because they say, oh, well, they got health insurance and they've got education, they've got this and they've got that. And it's like, oh, well, then they're fine, but they're not. So we help the ones that are not. So who specifically does ma'am serve? Uh, rank E5 and below. Um, across the board, we help all branches. And um, so that is our lowest enlisted service members. And that actually qualifies us for the charitable tax credit because they are um, working poor. Some of them are very working poor. And tell us a little bit more about, uh, about MAM. Um, how did it come to be? <laughs> well, it's Michael Adam Marzano is my son, and Military Assistance Mission is the organization. We call it MAM for short, which is Michael's initials. So um, it came to be because I saw the need and I knew I wanted to help. And at, when I was naming it, it was funny. I, I took about a month. So I, I, would, I had this little piece of paper on the bathroom sink, and I would write down Michael's legacy, Michael's mission, Michael's this. And I realized that that really wasn't going to help people understand what the need was, what we were there for. Um, it's great to name it after him, but I really want to help people. So I, wrote, I would start writing down military, and then assistance and then mission and then one day I swear there was just this light from God and uh, it said ma'am and I'm like there it is so that was how it got its name so you came up with the name and then yeah. you needed to take your willingness to help as as one individual and make it bigger 
how, how did that happen? Well, that, that's a lot of work, a lot of hours, and, and just a lot of determination. Um, I have a great board of directors, and some of them that were on my board back then are still on my board now. And, you know, you can't do it without your board and, and then your team behind you. And people are very patriotic, and they want to help, whether they volunteer or, you know, whether if we have a position and they come to work for us. Um, but, um, or they will say, hey, um, come and speak to our group so that they can help us raise funds for certain things. So um, it just all kind of fell into place. I think I have a higher power that's doing that. <laughs> well, um, can you tell us um, what you would say MAM's most important uh, role or mission is uh, for Arizona service members? Um, provide a roof over their heads. Um, keep the utilities on, keep the car, um, well, keep the car, period. Um, so we help with food, rent, mortgage, utilities, insurance. Uh, we have a couple of education programs and we have morale programs. So we make sure the kids get Christmas gifts and we have baby showers and we do seats for soldiers and um, so they can go to games and get a little bit of respite from the everyday worries. I don't know if you know, we had 750 service members leave I think just Saturday or whatever on a bus to head out and they're going to be heading overseas so um, and, and and so you were there uh, as part of that my team was there yes and we, we could instruct um, families you know if you have a need and we had five applications today just today of, of uh, rent and a lot of rent mortgage and I think it was a couple car and one utility so it was very, it was a very busy day, very busy morning. <laughs> and that's interesting because I think a lot of us who, who have served understand the, uh, they say that the, the spouses also serve. And, and so you were there for those spouses and families. Do you know, I remember years ago getting a phone call, getting phone calls when we had active OIF, OEF going on and the families were back. And I remember getting a phone call from a really young girl because I think she got married and then you know, right out of, we're at home, and then off he went, and she was like, how do I make a roast? Like, she really had no idea, so I walked her through making a roast, and, you know, some of them don't know how to do a checkbook, and some of them just don't know how to pay the bills, and so we're there to um, help with the finances, but if there's any kind of guidance like that, we're there too. Margie, can you talk a little bit more about the, the financial side of things? Ma'am is a 501c3 Yes. Nonprofit. So uh, you raise money so that you can provide money to help. Yes. Everything we do, we provide grants. So we we pay the bill directly. Like if it if it's a utility bill, then it money's paid directly to the utility company. If it's mortgage, same thing with the mortgage company or rent straight to the landlord. We do not provide money to service members. The closest that they come in form of that it would be like food cards, food gift cards, or but um, so in order to do that, because they don't pay us back, I, we, I, they're, paying, they're working paying my freedom, so they don't pay us back. So in order to do that, we have to go find funding. So we are always searching for funding. And we're not government funded, we're publicly funded. And so what are your major sources for funding those programs? Um, we get a lot of grants, which is, which is great, but the public is really wonderful. And veterans. Veterans are amazing, you know, they really are. And, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll find a salty um, Vietnam vet who's still angry. And I just, you know, will say, would you want somebody have to have treated you that way? And they don't, they didn't, they just want to vent. So I let them vent and then we have a conversation. And then they're very good at helping their brothers and sisters. And, and you have some uh, major fundraising events each year, is that correct? We do, we do. We have a golf tournament and uh, we have an event coming up October 21st, which is Monte Carlo night. So think James Bond, you know, and, and gowns and uh, casinos and they'll be dancing and a uh, speed painter and um, learning how to dance, but um, showgirls, so it'll, be some, it'll be so much fun. So yes, it is a fundraiser. Uh, what about some of the of the programs for uh, service members and their families? I know you have a big uh, holiday event coming up. The Christmas event is beyond 
great because um, the families get to go through and choose toys for their kids. Um, our biggest need is teen and tween because people want to give out a Barbie doll or Mattel car, but try giving that to a 12 or 13 year old. So we're always in the need of teen and tween gifts, but um, the parents go through and choose the gifts, but outside it's like a carnival. We've got food and cookie painting and face, cookie decorating and face painting and jumpy houses and trackless trains and Santa Claus and video games, everything to keep the kids entertained so that um, they're happy when they go through. And then, um, uh, but I was, I think I was telling you the story and it just meant so much to me and it's just in my head with this mom because they get, uh, they get 13 gallon bags and they get to fill the bags up with toys and the kids were probably about two and five and stuff and they had their little bags and the mom was sitting on a curb with her bag and the little girl was, didn't know, the mom didn't see me, I was walking from behind clearing up a parking lot and the little girl straddled her mom and said, cupped her face. She goes, Mom, this was my best day ever. And it still, it still gets to me because I was like, look what you did, Michael. You made some little girl's best day ever. She's probably had really great days since then, but we did the best day ever that day. How great is that to help out a kid? That's really, really fantastic. It's a wonderful legacy for, for Michael, for sure. Um, do you have uh, volunteers who help? Uh, how, how do you make all this, an, a big event like that happen? That, that's a lot of volunteers daily setting everything up, the rooms, getting everything ready for the families. And so, yes, we do have volunteers and you can go onto our website and register to volunteer. And we will send you things, events that are coming up. Like we have car shows that we have to be at a presence at, so we will need help with that. Um, the, the Monte Carlo night, we need volunteers. The Christmas event, huge volunteers and we do baby showers so we need volunteers to help us with that with um, wrapping the gifts setting up the room and stuff so that the parents can have a baby shower what are the biggest challenges that the military assistance mission has in in serving its its clients i you know we kind of are are well oiled right now but i think the biggest dilemma is people understanding that while you may you may not see Iraq Afghanistan like in your face every day in the news we've got people everywhere and we just sent 750 to Syria and Jordan and we've got people in Africa we've got people going to Poland and Germany and we've got people down on our borders and we've got people everywhere that are out there making sure that we're able to sit and watch TV tonight you obviously have uh, forged some excellent connections with the military units and the military community in Arizona because uh, you have to let those service members know about your your programs. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship with the with the reserve and active duty units here in the state of Arizona? Well, there's always a lot of change of command. You know, there's they're switching out every two to three years. But uh, you know, word of mouth. Um, and, and it really is word of mouth because we got a call from somebody in Yuma at MCAS down at the Marine Corps Air Station. We cover the whole state, so that's still on our border. And um, she wanted to know what we did so that she could share the information. And as soon as she did, it was like game on. Here, come, here came applications because people didn't know down there. Phoenix, we're pretty well known, but people didn't know down there that we were here, even though I've been down there over the years, of course, you know, but, um, you know, they let me breathe their air. I, like, I am still enamored, even, even my son, you know, he's my, always my hero, and his dad, um, but they, they let me in their world, and it's a crazy world. You know, the, the book of acronyms for the acronym book for the acronym book is, very large and they speak different language and they ma'am the bejeebers out of me and I keep, <laughs> I, you know, I get on them. I said, you know, if you keep calling me that, I'm going to make you one. And, you know, um, ma'am is my company is like calling me Ford or something like that. But I, the respect is, is really great. And so the, the experience um, seems like it's been really rewarding. It has. They let me into their world. Like I go to the Marine Corps ball. I go to, um, They've actually given me an award. Like, I don't know why, because I'm just doing my job. So I don't 
feel worthy. <laughs> They're worthy. Can you say a little bit more about uh, about our young service members? Like, what would you like the community to know about the 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 junior enlisted people who are really the backbone of our military? They really are. Um, they this is not a draft, so they've done this of their own free will, and for someone to sign on that dotted line that they're going to protect somebody that they don't know is just overwhelming to me to think about because they don't know me but that they're going to go off and fight for me and there's no no greater gift if someone watching this wants to help um, how can they do that call me <laughs> <laughs> I answer my phone all the time, uh, but they can go to our website, azmam.org, and uh, look for volunteer opportunities, look for fundraising events, um, have an event, and collect toys. Right now, we've got a, you know some companies that are collecting toys for us. We have Adopt a Family, where if you want to adopt a military family for um, Christmas, we don't just have our big event, but you can actually adopt a family, and hopefully you'll be honored and be able to breathe their air and meet them. Well, it, it's really a, an amazing uh, array of programs and offerings. So uh, congratulations to you and, and the whole team yeah. uh, there at MAM who make that happen. Um, what's next for, for MAM? Is there, where, where do you see the organization in, in five years or 10 years or, or where do you hope to see it? Um, I w I'd like to expand our programs. I would like to, we have a little scholarship program now and I would like to be able to give more. Um, and I'd just like to expand the assistance because every time I'm at an event, I, I listen to what a need is and find one that's not being filled and I want to fill it. So that's what I want to do. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I know that you have said that through MAM, uh, Michael's mission carries on, and I just want to thank you at every, uh, you and everyone at MAM for, uh, for honoring his legacy that way and, and spending some time with us. I, uh, I truly wish you all the best. Thank you. He was a cool kid. For many years, military service members that participated in the initial testing and development of our nation's atomic and nuclear weapons programs worked in secrecy and went largely unrecognized. While it's not clear just how many veterans took part in such operations due to the classified nature of their work, records indicate it could be more than half a million. Those atomic veterans still with us today are finally getting the recognition they deserve. In 2022, the Secretary of Defense established the Atomic Veterans Commemorative Service Medal to honor their dangerous and important work. See, when I was a kid, I remember when they dropped the nuclear weapons on Japan in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. I was only nine years old, but I heard, heard the people talking about how much damage it done, had done to the country. And uh, when one of those things went off that we were testing, was so much larger, so it, it's amazing. And the feeling you get if something like that was to come in on a populated area, it would be devastating. So that you, you, you realize how serious this was at the time. My position, uh, during these blasts was on the con, which was the top of the ship. And uh, as a result, obviously, I saw most of the blasts that occurred. And most of these blasts occurred about midnight. And uh, this one blast that I happened to see after the bomb was uh, dropped from the B-29, all of a sudden, from a pitch black night, the sky was brightly lit up startlingly so, from horizon to horizon, just a clear blue, like a noonday, Un unbelievable. It was eerie because we didn't hear any noise and uh, just looked about, just, just wondering what this was all about. I mean, it was something that we had never experienced before. But it just got to be just totally routine. It was no thing. <clears throat> the only time that it was not routine it was when they did their first big uh, underwater blast, right? And that was really, really interesting. 
Let's imagine this now. And it's just like a big boom and just sound like a hammer hitting the side of the ship. Didn't last very long, right? And I, the telephone rang, it checked for damage. So I had to walk all around through there. And then uh, that was over and then they, the whole ship was locked down. All the doors were closed and portholes closed and so forth. And I said, well, what did you see? What? You talking to me? At the time I was a first lieutenant and assigned to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. And somewhere around uh, the early summer, I received word uh, that uh, I was going to be moved to uh, uh, Fort Mercury, or Camp Mercury, uh, north of, uh, of Vegas. And I was to go there to witness uh, some atomic bombs. This is in 1957. And uh, when I got to the site, I was in a trench. And we were probably a mile from where the detonation took place. They tell you when the bomb would be released, and then the countdown to the detonation, and tell everybody to put on their goggles and be in an area where you could be. So you put on your goggles, and they count down, and the tests go off, and you have glass and the light. Your glasses light up brighter than any day you've ever seen. I look at the rest of my Navy career, there are a lot of different things that occurred, but uh, th th this, I think, from a national security standpoint, was the most impactful. We went there on a mission to make an impact to our enemy at the time, the Soviet Union, and the mission was accomplished. As a result of those blasts, they, uh, they, they went back to their respect, their country, and the, let me put it this way, the Soviets stopped being the aggressor and trying to trying to advance to the uh, to 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 our shores. I mean that I served my country to the, the best that I could and hope that being an atomic veteran is something that we never need again. Today we are here to honor all our brave atomic war veterans. Hello, I'm Captain Brad Oster, the commanding officer of USS Jack H. Lucas, the Navy's first Flight 3 DDG. The crew is super excited to have everyone come on board and see the latest technology. We'd also like to thank the citizens of Tampa, Florida for hosting the commissioning. We thank you for hosting us and letting us see all that Tampa has to offer. Once again, welcome aboard and enjoy the tour. Hi, welcome on board Jack H. Lucas. My name is Commander Matthew Klein, XO on board. This ship's named after the youngest Marine to ever receive the Medal of Honor, Jack Lucas. Just like our namesake, we have been dominating every step of the way. We are the indestructible. 120 day crew cert done in just over 80 days, moving into engineering evolutions and drills, seamanship, navigation, you name it, we do it. Test set, test complete, regard our further alarms. Hi, I'm DCC Select. Brian Petway, and today we're going to be talking about our water mist system on board USS Jack H. Lucas. It's the first water mist system on board a DDG. Essentially, it is a sprinkler system inside of the main space that allows us to fight those fuel and oil fires inside of the space. Very innovative. One of the greatest systems I've ever seen, and it's something I'm proud to have on board the ship. Hello, my name is Master Chief Brian Jackson, and I'm the Combat Systems Maintenance Manager of Jack H. Lucas. Behind me, the Octagon Radar is Spy-6. It was developed from the ground up to provide integrated air and missile defense capability against larger raids and increased battle space. It's considered the eyes of our ship and one of the major upgrades to the Flight 3 DDG. I'm Gunner's Mate First Class Corey Vark, CG Division LPO. To my right is the Mark 45 Mod 4 5-inch gun. It's capable of firing up to 16 to 20 rounds per minute, up to 20 nautical miles is our deterrent against anti-air, anti-surface, and naval surface firing support. And this gun right here is the reason why we're indestructible. Thank you for visiting Jack H. Lucas, the Navy's first Flight 3 destroyer to hit the fleet.
General C.Q. Brown Jr. closed out his three-year tenure as the Air Force's highest ranking officer, taking on the even more challenging position as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. His signature strategic approach, Accelerate Change or Lose, provided a blueprint to airmen, senior leaders, and industry partners for pressing the operational, technical, and cultural changes necessary to meet global threats and at a speed ensuring U.S. air power remains supreme. When I became the Chief of Staff of the Air Force three years ago, I expressed the need to accelerate change. My conviction has not wavered. The journey of change must continue to strengthen our national security. It's a tremendous privilege to serve as the 21st Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, focused on sharpening our warfighting prowess in defense of our national interest. Lower income military families using Department of the Air Force Child Development Centers will see more affordable fees starting at the end of the year. The new policy is in line with the Department of Defense working to reduce the burden of child care costs. Leslie Smith, Chief of Air Force Child and Youth Programs, says child care providers are mission enablers with a goal to care for Air and Space Force families. She says the adjusted fees will allow members to get high quality care at a reasonable cost. Major General Jeannie Levitt marked the closing of her distinguished career after 31 years of service. From being the Air Force's first female fighter pilot to being the first woman to command the 57th Wing at Nellis Air Force Base, Nevada, she crafted a legacy and influenced lives that will resonate for generations. U.S. Transcom Commander General Jacqueline Van Ovos recounted the hurdles and triumphs that defined Levitt's career, saying Levitt's aspirations were never solely for herself, but about lifting an entire community. That's your look around the Air Force. I'm Technical Sergeant Vernon Young. Thanks for watching Veterans AZ. Find more information and past episodes at veteransaz.org. See you next time.